he rode seven miles out into the ocean. It was a cold winter night. He went there to steal their money. But the robbery went awry, and he ended up killing two women. Or did he? The Isles of Shoals are a group of seven islands located seven miles off the coast of Portsmouth, New Hampshire and Kittery, Maine. Since 1915, Star Island has operated during the summer as a seasonal conference center where individuals and families spend time reuniting with friends they've made there year after year. Nearby Smutty Nose Island was the location of a gruesome double murder that occurred in 1873. On the Isles of Shoals, there is a deep history of social activism, community, and eccentricity. The Isles of Shoals, and especially Star Island, became a popular summer vacation spot for artists, writers, and wealthy New Englanders during the Victorian era. But an integral part of the island's history are the macabre legends and lore that are retold there year after year. Why are these stories such a big part of the Star Island experience? There are many, many ghost stories out here, but the more factual stories that include murder, death, include um, the very popular case of the Smutty Nose Murders, um, Betty Moody's Cave, and the story of Miss Underhill um, and her chair out on the rocks. Miss Underhill was a school teacher out here in the 1800s. She was sitting out on the rocks in this chair on a cliff. She was out there one day with her boyfriend, significant other. She gets pulled into the sea while he's still there and he just leaves and she's gone. About a week later, she was found washed up on the shore of the beach in York, Maine. But it's a curious story. There's a there's somebody there with her, some guy. Now, she is by this time in her, her I think, 34 years old. Um, she's dis maybe despondent. There is a storm coming in, but she's out there with another character. She falls off the rocks, and she's been out on these rocks day after day after day. Why would she suddenly fall off now? We can't be sure, but, mm. you know, some people may think it's murder. Some people may believe it's a wave. Um, but I can tell you, she's not the only person to meet her demise out there. So the big question is, did Nancy Underhill trip? Uh, did a rogue wave, as we're told, actually rise up way, way up one single wave and wash her ashore? Or was she pushed? Blackbeard uh, used to come by. He used to hide out here even before there was a fishing village because Captain Smith discovered it, and of course the pirates used it as a base. He told his wife that he was going to go um, away for a little bit and then return, and that he never did. I think either his ship was sunk or something happened, and then the woman um, ended up dying on Star, and she's usually found around um, East Rock or by the art barn wearing just a white gown. Pirates. I mean, everywhere I go, I get asked two questions when I talk about history. Uh, how many pirates were at the Alza Shoals, and have you seen any ghosts lately? Uh, there are no ghosts, and there were probably very few pirates. But people don't want to hear this. What, what they want to hear is the swashbuckling stories. So Blackbeard is the pirate we talk about a lot. We have absolutely no evidence whatsoever on the face of the earth that Blackbeard ever did anything but possibly float by. As far as I know, they've, they've never found any treasure. Uh, yet that they look, they keep looking. They never have found treasure, though. Why Blackbeard would bury his treasure on an island that was almost entirely rocks and ledge and with no place to bury. Uh, why he would leave his 14th wife here to guard his treasure. It's just crazy stories. There's even one story that says he left a goat, so that maybe that happened. In 1724, Native Americans began to really rebel against European settlement along the coastline. And back then, the summer house was called Fort Star. It was an actual fort. It was a very secure structure for the people of the town to hide in. And one day, the watchman 
saw canoes rowing out to Star Island, so he sounded the alarm bells. Betty Moody and her infant son were trapped outside of the palisade, so she ran out onto the rocks. A rock formation that is that's basically like a cave that's also out on the east side of the island. It's sort of down in like a fjord type thing, like a crack between two rocks. The Indians started sweeping the island for um, colonists who didn't who uh, didn't make, manage to make it back to the fort. Her son started crying, so she clamped her hand over the son's mouth. Was trying to muffle the baby's cries so the Indians wouldn't kill her, and uh, apparently the baby suffocated. And ever since then, the story goes, you, uh, sometimes at night you'll be able to hear an infant crying from her cave out on the rocks. On March 6, 1873, just after midnight, someone entered a home on Smutty Nose Island, about 10 miles from Portsmouth, about seven miles off the coast of New Hampshire, and killed Annette Christensen and her sister Karen Christensen with an ax and strangled them. A Prussian fisherman named Louis Wagner was down on his luck. He was jealous of the people living out on Smutty Nose Island. It was a Norwegian family living alone on the island. He had lived with them. He'd kind of been thrown out because a bunch of relatives came from Norway for this successful fisherman named John Honfett and his wife Marin. Some guy rode in a canoe and it's like a 10 mile row. He was having like way too much beer and whiskey and he was drunk and he got an ax and went to Smutty Nose. The Smutty Nose murder was very, very clearly a robbery gone wrong. Lewis Wagner stole a boat in Portsmouth. He heard when the men were ashore one day that the women were gonna be alone on the island and he thought he could row out, slip in while the women were asleep, take the money because he was pretty sure he knew where it was hidden and row back without anybody ever knowing he'd been there. And is it Louis Wagner or is that the... That sounds familiar. Uh, so. Uh, Louis Wagner, we'll call him, came out, and I don't remember what the motivations were, but he hacked them all to death and escaped, and I guess it's somewhat of an unsolved, although I guess we know the name of the killer. <laughs> well, I think it's presumed. Right. So he, you know, does what he originally came to do and kind of searches the house for the chest. He never finds it. He finds other little purses that, you know, all adds up to about $15. So after 15 years as a steward on Smutty Nose Island, I was driven crazy by people telling me the wrong story about the two ex-murders out there. Uh, two innocent women killed in the middle of the night in March 1873 by an unknown assailant who we all know who exactly who it was. Louis Wagner did it? Is that, is that fact? I mean, Marin confessed to it on her deathbed. The spooky part of the story that people have always told me is that, that the, the fourth daughter was covered in blood, even though by her own testimony she went nowhere near any of the bodies and was nowhere near the, uh, the actual killings. So it's always been kind of a mystery who actually managed to, who actually did the, did the killing on Smutty Nose. But they've done tests to see if like you can row down the river and like get out to the shoals, kill the family, get back to the mainland, like in a dory, like the one you would have had access to under the right tidal conditions, because nobody believes like the timing could have worked out. And right, Lewis Wagner was a dory fisherman. He rowed for a living, and this was no big deal. Uh, John Honfett at the trial mentioned that he had rowed in and back fifty times while he was out at the Isles of Shoals. But people just look at something and it's like looking at a mountain and saying, you know, no one could climb that mountain when there's a hundred guys that have just done it. There's a reason why he was the last person to be hung for capital punishment in the state of Maine. There's so much uncertainty around this thing. Yes, there were a couple of other theories. Uh, all of them, most of them started by Lewis Wagner. There were people uh, at next door at Star Island uh, building the hotel that year. And you know, could somebody have rowed over and killed two women for absolutely no reason? Looked exactly like Louis Wagner so that Annetta would yell his name, leave no blood evidence, never be caught, no one would ever hear of them. Sure, sure. I mean, you know, aliens could have killed Kennedy too. I think it's part of the human condition, wanting to know what it was like on Star 100, 200 years ago. 
and it's only natural for Starland history to include folklore and legends, like Miss Underhill's chair, Betty Moody's cave, and the murders on Smutty Nose. Did those stories actually happen the way they're written down today? We don't know. We can only piece together what we know is true and fill in the gaps as best we can. I'm absolutely 1,000% sure that Lewis Wagner stole a boat in Portsmouth, rode 10 miles, attempted to rob the house, and when discovered, dispatched with an ax and strangled two of the women on Smutty Nose Island. Why is it that people need to believe that a lying, thieving sociopath who says he didn't do it is the one person who's telling the truth? The great thing about legends is that legends preserve memories. I mean, if we didn't exaggerate the stories and if we didn't kind of romanticize the stories, we wouldn't remember the stories. But to then say, as some of these local magazines have been saying, uh, that people routinely see the women wandering the island searching for the killer, or as I was just reading in a recent book, uh, people frequently see Blackbeard digging for his treasure on Lunging Island. What is that? Who frequently sees a ghost digging for treasure? Well, they're, they're exciting, they're moral stories, um, and they're very interesting. Uh, it's not something that happens every day. You know, there are morals to these stories? Like, no. That, it's just like, no. this bad thing happens. Murders and deaths. Usually the parents use it to scare their kids into bed, but sometimes, like, um, it's just like an entertaining thing, like back in the olden days when there were cowboys and Indians. And it's just really entertaining to hear what would be happening back in those times. I mean, we all told these when we were little kids, and then we rarely revisit them. Um, sometimes we would go to the historian and ask them for some of the ghost stories, but the smutty nose stories especially rarely figure in to the Star Island ethos. Um, so I think that just as kids grow up, little bits are lost, little bits are added. And it becomes up to like individual interpretation of their original memories. I think legends are great. I think myths are great. You know, I mean, Joseph Campbell tells us that myths are more important than history because they're more real, they're more lasting. But I'm not talking about the myth about the creation of the earth. I'm talking about legends about taking a woman who is the innocent victim of an axe murder and making her the axe murderer. There's something wrong with that. It really bothered me that people were asking a question when no question needed to be asked. And I think we we do this a lot. We, we want to know the truth even when the truth is right in front of our face. These are the stories that I think are fascinating, not so much whether Blackbeard left his 14th wife or a goat on the Isles of Shoals to guard a treasure that he didn't really have. These buildings, this island, you know, it's changed throughout the years. You look at pictures from 1920 and you could say it hasn't changed at all. The buildings, yes, new windows, new paint, but they're the same buildings. You're standing in the same place that some of these things happened. You're sitting in Miss Underhill's chair. You can sit there today. You can go down in Betty Moody's cave and pretend to hide from Native Americans. You can go over to Smutty Nose and wash your hands in the same well that Wagner did, or Marin, or whoever. <laughs> these stories, I feel like talking about them over and over, our obsession with them are both related to kind of trying to understand and also there's no separation from the past when you're out here. You kind of are immersed in the same world and to be where they were is just, I think that's why they're so gripping because it's very immersive.